It's great to be back in Virginia. My wife, Dr. Joanne Badertha, who's a geneticist and pediatrician, uh, and I were at the Medical College of Virginia VCU for 27 plus years and have been at Hopkins for the past seven years. What I want to do is tell you why palliative care is the right choice right now and try to convince you that palliative care is the best type of care. None of us got into palliative care to save money. Uh, my wife might say that I'm somewhat of a cheapskate, but um, <laughs> the fact that we can improve people's care and not cost the health system more money is pretty remarkable in 20, 2019. I'm also going to try to convince you that doing good palliative care is like making apple butter. And these are my sister's three children there, um, who I make a fall pilgrimage out to, to make apple butter once a year. And it's the right ingredients, the right recipe, the right team, time, education, assessment tools, and management, and really time. So palliative care is the fastest growing specialty in the country right now. We've gone from, in 2000, literally about 500 programs to having over 2,000 programs now nationwide. And over 90% of hospitals of any size have a palliative care program. So we must be doing something right. We are now a board certified specialty like geriatrics and oncology and nephrology. We have pediatrics. You can come into the field from pediatrics, psychiatry, radiation oncology, surgical, surgery, surgical specialties, family medicine, you name it. And since 2012, the fellowship, which you're starting today, and not to put any pressure on you, for <laughs> but the fellowship um, has become extremely competitive. Here's, here's some of the statistics for why people like you are needed at EVMS and the Norfolk area and everywhere. There are about as many geriatricians as palliative care people. There's one palliative medicine physician for every 1,700 people with serious illness. Contrast that to cardiologists, where there's one cardiologist for every 500 plus people. Um, and we train 700 a year. And we train about 325 palliative medicine fellows a year. So we need to, to keep working, working on that. Most of you know what hospice is. Hospice is a type of care delivered in the home in the US. In other places, it's more inpatient. Pioneered by Dame Cicely Saunders, who was a nurse and a doctor and a social worker, and apparently quite a pill by herself. But it emphasizes the palliation of a terminally ill patient's symptoms when there are no longer curative therapies and no good reasonable options for continuing treatment. In the US, it's, it's somewhat hampered by reimbursement set at $190 a day. We hope to actually change that. We're part of a national experiment now at about 120 centers with Medicare that people can go on hospice light, if you will, and still get advanced heart failure management, COPD management, chemotherapy and radiation therapy for up to two years. We will see what, it, what the facts show in about 18 months, but we're hoping that that early exposure to hospice will improve pretty much everything. There is an app available for your iPhone, uh, the Hospice in a Minute app that tells you what hospice is. And we're now in the process of trying to train most providers to, to be able to use it. What's surprising when I talk about hospice, people go, <gasps> hospice? That means I'm dying. And my immediate impulse as an oncologist, well, not right, right, right now, not right now. <laughs> I didn't really mean hospice. <laughs> um, as opposed to now, I've learned to say, well, Tell me more about what you know about hospice. Those are the three most important words in the English language. Tell me more. Um, as opposed to, <gasps> the surprising fact is that people who use hospice compared to those who don't clearly have better symptom control, clearly have less distressed relatives. In fact, the survival of the remaining spouse is higher in the, in the coming year. It's actually measurable from what hospice bereavement does. But people actually live about a month longer than those who don't. That's, I'm an oncologist, I have to show a survival curve. There has to be 
um, starting out at 100% here, down to 0% and time on this axis. And at any one point, you want to be where the light purple palliative care star is. You want to be on the right-hand side of that survival curve. And this is lung cancer and pancreas cancer, but it's the same for congestive heart failure and some other diseases. But about 30 years ago now, at least some of us in oncology wondered, well, why do you have to wait to be dying to get somebody paying attention to you and your family's needs and spiritual needs? Can't we sort of swim upstream? So the palliative care comes from the Latin pallidum to throw a cloak over. We have our own Dame Cicely Saunders. This is Diane Meyer up at the top who runs the Center to Advance Palliative Care. For those of you old enough to remember, this is Princess Di, who was a staunch advocate of palliative care and hospice. Tammy Quest, who runs the ED program, emergency department program at Emory, and is our president of our association this year. She has six doctors in the emergency department who do nothing but palliative care. And Rebecca Kirsch, who's a, an attorney, who got interested in palliative care when her brother was dying from lung cancer and he just wanted to go home and be with his kids. And she was, was his staunch advocate and got him home that same afternoon. But it's specialized p medical care for people with serious illness, relief from symptoms, pain and stress, whatever the diagnosis, improve your quality of life. And I talk about providing an extra layer of support and it can be provided together with curative treatment. That's an awfully long definition. I've learned to say, well, it's palliative care, it's medically appropriate goal setting, open and honest communication, and the best symptom management and control. There won't be a quiz on any of this, <laughs> um, but there are now at least a dozen randomized trials where half the group got usual care and half the group got usual care plus a palliative care team assigned to them. And these first two trials were done by Kaiser Permanente. And what they showed was that for 800 patients, half of whom got palliative care, survival was exactly the same. Palliative care doesn't kill people. People with guns are kill people. People with mustaches kill people. But palliative care doesn't kill people. And the patient experience was markedly better. Increased satisfaction, more deaths at home. How many people want to die in the ICU on a ventilator with three, three drips going? Any takers? How many people would prefer if, to, to die at home, surrounded by loved ones and their pets, right? How many would prefer not to die at all? Yeah. <laughs> it's, but what amazed Kaiser Permanente was that the cost was remarkably lower. And so this is why Kaiser Permanente in every market that they're in has a really strong palliative care presence. It's better care and it lets the, cost, the healthcare dollars go better. So this is Irene Higginson's trial with people with profound dyspnea and the survival was actually markedly better. It was 15 out of 100 at three years and the cost was actually equal or less. Some of these others, these are bone marrow transplant patients decreased depression, decreased anxiety. There's not a single one where survival is less. If you put those, and there's not a single one where palliative care costs, costs more. So how do you make good, good palliative care? I mean, back out in rural Ohio where I grew up on a small farm, I mean, the first thing you do is you round up your nephews who are getting increasingly hard to do as they get into their teen years. You round them up and you go to Ritman Orchards one of the big Mennonite orchards nearby. I grew up in Amish Mennonite country and everybody gets to pick a peck of apples to bring home. Then you need the right recipe and the right team and some time. I like to use the blue book, the ball blue book. And palliative care actually works. This is data from VCU where we looked every year at a month's patient symptoms before and after we saw them. And that this is part of our data and MD Anderson's data is superimposable. Every time we looked, patients' pain, dyspnea, even depression got better in 24 to 48 hours because somebody was paying attention to it. What was really surprising though was the difference in survival. We were one of the first to show this with a form of advanced pain management. So using 
medicines right in the intraspinal space. So putting medications li like local anesthetics right in the sp around the spinal cord, this blue line is the people who are randomized to get this new way of relieving pain, and this red line is the group of people who got the best possible medical management you could do. That's a difference of 12 people out of 100 at six months. So relieving pain seems to make a big difference. This is Marie Bacchitis' trial with cancer patients in New Hampshire and Vermont. Four visits with an advanced practice nurse. Four, count and visit. That's the intervention. It's not rocket science. This is Jennifer Temmel's trial with lung cancer patients at Mass General in, in Boston. These patients got the blue line, got their regular oncology care there. It's a great place to get your lung cancer treatment. This group with the purple star got the same care, but they met with the palliative care team once a month. Half the rate of depression, half the rate of anxiety, marked reduction in caregiver distress, and people lived 2.7 months longer. And it actually didn't cost Mass General any, any more. Even though they live longer, they spent less per day. So here's a bunch of other trials. There's not a single one where the palliative care trial is, sh shows worse survival. We're trying to drill down on that now. This is Ethan Bash's work using a, an iPhone app. So it brings up a word cloud on your iPhone and you press the symptom that bothers you the most and it gives you a scale to rate it on zero to 10 and you move, the, move it to where it is and there's a nurse at the other end who's actually watching these scales and when they see a spike, they don't say, oh, patient's pain is nine out of 10, that's nice. <laughs> they pick up the phone and call them or email them or text them and bring, or bring them in and try to fix pain, shortness of breath, nausea, vomiting. This is survival. And the group here that had this patient reported outcome reporting had six months longer to live with metastatic cancer than those who didn't. Six months. And that's a difference of six people out of 100 at a year, two years, and three years. With lung cancer, the difference is even bigger. This was just published. It's a trial done in France. Again, web-reported patient symptom monitoring. If you pay attention to people's symptoms and fix them early, people not only live better, but they live longer. The nice thing is it doesn't cost more money. So we started the VCU's program back in the 90s. Um, I was brought to Hopkins to help expand the program, which was very small, concentrated in the cancer center and take it institution-wide. And one of the first things we did was involve the fiscal analysis unit at Hopkins to look at the impact on the health system. That's a blip in their budget. I mean, they have an $8 billion budget for all of Hopkins, including all the defense things. So we're, that's the budget of a medium-sized country. So we're just this little tiny blip. But we published with people from the, bus, the fiscal analysis unit, Michael Cardamone, Terry Langbaum, Chun-Hua Lee, that we actually saved the institution money. So we bettered symptoms, made people probably live longer, and save people money, it's probably three times that now. All right, so how do you do this? If it's not rocket science, how do you do it? Well, first thing you do is you start cutting up the apples. You wanna make sure that you start everybody with 10 fingers and everybody ends with 10 fingers. <laughs> this has gotten less of an issue as the kids have gotten bigger. And it's just, it's just time. It's an hour a month that somebody has to spend with the patient. It doesn't have to be the doctor. In fact, I think Nurses are probably better at this. Advanced practice nurses are probably a lot better than most doctors at this. That's, but somebody has to spend the time to actually figure out what the symptoms are. It's fine to do it on an iPhone, but it's even better if you can do it in person. But it has to be structured at an hour a month. The E stands for education. That's find out what people know and what they want to know. I left these sitting on my desk. I brought about 100 temporary tattoos. We have these temporary tattoos that go on your inner forearm. They last about 10 days. And so I make myself in clinic pretend that I'm looking at my forearm to say, how do you like to get medical information? Are you the sort of person who wants all the details? <gasps> no, don't tell me any bad news. People will say that. 
10% of people don't want to hear bad news. And then you can say, well, who else can I talk to in your family? And most people will say, as somebody said earlier this week in the multidisciplinary liver clinic with a terrible liver cancer, said, look, I'm 49 years old. Don't sugarcoat anything for me. I got a business. I got kids. Don't sugarcoat anything for me. Tell, me. tell it to me straight. If you don't ask permission, you don't know that you have permission. And second is, what is what's your understanding of your situation? I'm told this also works well at home. Honey, Joanne, what's your understanding of the checkbook situation? <laughs> Number three, what's important to you? Number four, what are you hoping for? We try to make sure that at every visit to the cancer center, each patient gets asked, what are you hoping for? Because we won't know otherwise. And then the last one is more motivational interviewing. Have you, have you thought about a time in the future when you might be sicker and might need an advanced directive or living well? It's an easy, simple way to bring it up. We've translated this into a bunch of languages. We've passed out over 8,000 of these. I usually wear one. I should have put one on this morning. The nice thing, if you're a skinny old white guy like me, if I go to the weight room, I get more respect. <laughs> so it's not rocket science. You, you chunk up the apples. You cook them. You put them through the Foley food mill. You add cinnamon and cloves. More is always better. And you start boiling until, as Aaron says, hey, look, it's a volcano. When it starts to plop, then you know your apple butter is almost ready. The E for education is to tell people what is likely to happen after you've asked permission. It's fine as long as people have some realistic information. Most people will overestimate their chances by a lot. And that's fine as long as you've given them an option to know. Is it cure? Is it a year on average? I told two people that earlier this week. Everyone's different, but just so you can plan, it's probably not going to be many years. We'll hope to get a year and then some time after that, but it could also be shorter. Months, not years. We're pretty good at this forecasting. This lets people plan. I can tell you as somebody who's dealt with recurrent cancer myself over the past 18 months with radiation, surgery, a type of chemotherapy, um, there's nothing you can bring up as a provider that we haven't already lain awake thinking about at night. There is nothing you can bring up that isn't appropriate to talk, to talk about, because chances are it's bothering us. We do symptom management, try to get people to offer realistic options for treatment. The words I use is say, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about where we are with this illness. Can we talk about what the options are? Again, simple, easy scripts to have. The assessments, the A stands for assessment and team. We use this one here, Are you the one on the right-hand side, the Memorial Symptom assess, Assessment Scale. Are you bothered by pain? Okay, tell me, tell me more about it. Are you bothered by tiredness? Are you bothered by nausea? Are you bothered by depression? Are you bothered by anxiety? If you don't ask, people won't tell you. I can't tell you the number of times as an oncologist, I go in and ask people, well, how are you? I'm fine. Because <laughs> they're afraid that if they complain a lot, I'll stop giving them their treatment. When in fact, you have to do these formal assessments. People get tired of this old white guy asking them questions, but it's the only way you can get the information. We actually have this as a formal epic uh, note. So I can bring it up on the screen just like I bring up the CAT scan to show people. I can bring this up on the screen and say, these are the questions I'm going to ask you. Let me type in the, the answers while we're going here. And then we'll print it out. And I'll send it to your oncologist, your surgical oncologist, your radiation oncologist, and your primary care physician so we're all on the same page. Back to Pat, apple butter. You want to go to Layman's Hardware. They're the largest purveyor of non-electric goods in the country. They had a big thing during y year Y2K. Remember Y2K? They, had, they sold more non-electric irons. Remember the irons that you put on an old stove? 
So they had hundreds of people order these irons and then send them back saying, how do you get it hot? <laughs> it's a great place if you're in central Ohio to go and get some uh, ball canning jars. You want to simmer till it's thick, taste regularly, put on fresh snow, fresh, put on fresh bread, lots of butter. Uh, if any is left with three teenage boys now, it's uh, remarkable that any gets left. My, my youngest uh, nephew, Aaron, has eaten eight apple butter sandwiches at a sitting. Um, and if you use these plastic things, there's no need to sterilize it. And that, that'll feed three hungry boys for about a week. <laughs> and the M stands for management. It's not rocket science, but you have to have set protocols for nausea, for all the things that bother people. And it really helps to have an interdisciplinary team. You don't have to do it all yourself. You can, do, um, you can direct patients to this prepare for your care. For those of us who our patients should have advanced care planning done, advanced directives, but haven't done it, you don't have to do it all in the office. You can actually direct them to this website. And in many states, you can upload this directly um, onto something that's shareable. This is one, the best program that I've, I've figured out. So finally, you're, up, you're left with, with apple butter. It's really simple. It's easy. Everybody likes it. Doesn't cost that much. So I hope that I've convinced you that palliative care alongside usual care is better care. Um, that's my youngest uh, nephew, Aaron, there. And we're trying to make uh, blueberry pancakes without anybody getting burned. <laughs> it's relatively easy to do, but you need the right ingredients. You need the right recipe. You need the right team, and you need time. And most importantly, you need a fellow. And you have a fellow. And in fact, I brought for your fellow some apple butter. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. Can we take uh, maybe a couple of minutes and it, for you to answer some questions from the audience? If you have a patient who's just received a cancer diagnosis, when is the time to introduce palliative care? So we've worked, based on these multiple, multiple randomized clinical trials, we rewrote the guidelines for the American Society of Clinical Oncology, my professional organization, and the National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network the NCCN guidelines, and both of them say any advanced cancer patient should be seen by a multidisciplinary palliative care team within eight weeks of diagnosis. There aren't enough people to do that. There aren't enough fellows. We need to clone him <laughs> um, after he finishes his fellowship and passes his boards. <laughs> but we did the same thing with breast cancer management back when lumpectomy plus radiation therapy clearly had superior results. There weren't enough surgeons trained to do l good lumpectomies, but we figured let's push out the guideline. Let's say this is the preferred way of treating early stage breast cancer and push the field. One of the things you learn in palliative care is that you don't have to do everything on the first diagnosis, on, on the first day. And that's one of the important parts about that Mass General study was that lung cancer patients met with the team once a month. That's really key. For an oncologist, we talk about dose intensity. You have to get a certain amount of chemo in per unit of time. And it's the same thing with palliative care. It, can't, it rarely can be just one visit to, to really change very much. So, I saw somebody just recently who has cholangiocarcinoma, a young woman. She's had a liver transplant. She's had multiple complications. She has recurrent disease. So we spent an hour this week going over her symptoms. And on our next visit, we'll say, have you done any attention to what might happen down, down the road? Have you done any advanced care planning? Are there things that you need to do? I, we talk about 
are there issues of faith, family, finances, fun? For this young woman, I think it will be important for her as she gets sicker over the next year to think about her legacy, how she wants to be remembered. And really important to let people know what's likely to happen to them so that they can use the time they have to the best advantage. For those of you who work in hospice or have had loved ones, I, I can't tell you the number of times I've said, if I'd only known Joe was gonna get this sick from chemotherapy, I wish we wouldn't have done it because we had so many other things we wanted to do. And my point is, well, you have a serious illness, let's make a list of those things you wanna do and do them now. But it doesn't have to be all on one visit. But the guidelines say within eight weeks of diagnosis for every advanced cancer patient. Thank you, Tom. Don't, don't uh, once again, I want to thank Dr. Smith for a very stimulating and comprehensive review of palliative medicine. Most importantly, I want to offer him this gift in appreciation oh. for coming to Norfolk and on behalf of uh, EVMS, contributing to our community focus and our world focus as leaders in quality medical care. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a wonderful thank you. Excuse me. So um, we have part two of our presentations this evening. And um, I have to say that uh, this is a really a delight for me to introduce our next speaker. Dr. Michael Geller is a very special person in many ways. With a background in social work, he retrained in medicine and geriatrics. Although he retired a few years ago from the Glennon Center, I keep trying to bring him back into our practice. <laughs> he is a very special individual but he isn't that devoted <laughs> to geriatrics. Um, he rediscovered upon his retirement his love for photography, but he never stopped being an advocate for family caregivers. As you will see in his exhibit, A Labor of Love, Dr. Geller has merged his passions of social work, geriatrics, and photography, thereby bringing a sensitivity to the roles of patient caregivers that is unique and inspirational. I hope you'll join me in welcoming my good friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Geller. Dr. Parr, many thanks for your kind words. I'm very pleased to celebrate with you the Brock Fellowship for Hospice and Palliative Medicine. I feel it's a key step forward in making a difference in the lives of patients and also in the lives of their caregivers. I'm grateful for having been on the faculty of Eastern Virginia Medical School, the Department of Medicine at the Glennon Center for Geriatrics and Gerontology. And I appreciate that my colleagues have included the content of my exhibit in the training of second and third year medical students and also for students for the advancement of geriatric education. I feel privileged to have also been selected by the Chrysler Museum of Art to share the product of my skill in photography and storytelling at this place of great art, learning, and community engagement. My exhibit, A Labor of Love, The Caregiver Portraits, presents in photographs and stories the experience of the unpaid caregiver in the home and the passion for what they do. They assist their loved ones in activities of daily living, in medications, in transportation, and in many other helpful ways. In 2012, when I began this project, I thought it won't take long, maybe a year, which reminds me of what my mother told me about my room. Clean it up. Well, Mom, I'm still working on it. 
to bring the project to life, I would use my beautiful Deardorff camera. And this is an amazing camera. Uh, but it takes a long time to set it up in any given place. And I became concerned that I would put folks to sleep before I got it done, rather than have them be just relaxed. So what happened was I tried another camera, a smaller film camera, and then I started using a digital camera and things worked really well. To recruit participants, I had help from Brenda Cobb and Christiane Nesbitt. We created a roadshow. From the beginning, I told the goal to everyone to recognize and appreciate what caregivers do. I was often asked, when and where? I didn't know, but I persisted. This photograph reminds me of an article that appeared in the Virginian Pilot in 2017 on New Year's Day. There was concern after publication of this article that I would be swamped with individuals wanting to participate. The article did not result in any new interest from folks who might be caregivers. Early on in meeting with caregivers, I discovered, as it were, three terms of engagement, if you will, highlighting the caregiver relationship that's similar to what caregivers have with healthcare providers. Trust, time, and planning. Of these, the greatest is trust. For healthcare providers to achieve success when their patient has a caregiver in the picture at home, the caregiver must also feel trust. Our experience was no different. Trust is gained by listening and demonstrating understanding. This leads to a confidence that you will follow through even as their realities change. On several occasions, when we arrived at the home of a caregiver, as planned, we would hear, who are you and what are you doing here? Once we identified who we were and why there, we were given options. Would you like to wait or come back another time? After a few of these, we learned that if there's a longer time between the knock and the answer, at someone's home, a caregiver's home, we know that something is going to be different. The caregiver's reality became our reality. Caregivers don't know what's going to happen any given day, but they do know something is going to happen that they hadn't expected. In this situation, no one answered when I knocked. Clyde, it turns out, was not at home. I didn't know that. I just knew that no one was answering. So what I did was I wrote a note and I attached it to the doorknob. About mm, a week or so later, I got a call from Clyde's daughter. She began, Who exactly are you and how do you know my father? Realities change. Dad was now in hospice. He had been taking care of his wife, who was in hospice. But his health took a dramatic change. Not only did the daughter take care of the situation locally, she relocated her stepmother to be near her, 100 miles away. And then, when her father was in hospice, she arranged for him to be transported to the same location. Now, near her, her father and her stepmother were close together. He saw himself as his wife's protector. And together now, he could reach out and touch her hand. Ah, time. The Cherokee proverb tells us, don't let yesterday use up too much of today. Every caregiver faces this challenge. How do I get done when I need to get done in the time I have to do it. Making breakfast, not too much trouble. Getting to eat breakfast, now that's a challenge. If we put time 
in a philosophical perspective and ask if humankind is a special case of life, then we can think of the healthcare provider, the possibilities of providing care for the loved one of a caregiver, everything that could be done relies on the special case of the caregiver who knows the whole life and experience of their loved one 24 by 7, even when they're not with them. Tammy returned to take care of her former husband and their two children when he became ill. And she held three jobs to do this, to make it happen. Very special person. Planning. When caregivers accompany their loved one to a medical appointment, the appointment is on your schedule, the provider's schedule. Caregivers schedule their day around the appointment. We know the outcome of visits can be more successful if there's recognition of the caregiver's time and sensitivity to their needs. So when we ask, what is your day like? How may I assist you? It can change the whole experience. In this photo, we see Tonya on your left and Nikisha. On my return visit to the family after Nikisha died, I thought in advance that there may be issues that need to be addressed, but I did not know what they were. What I did is I invited a social worker with whom they had prior contact to come to the visit. During that visit, the social worker offered to secure grief counseling for Nikisha's three children. That was amazing for this family. My exhibit does not shy away from what you might expect to see and read about stress or financial burdens in the home of a caregiver. In the photographs and stories, you will also see pictures of joy and contentment. When caregiver Rosa talks about her caregiving experience, she explains that she is grateful for the burden. When caregiver Vivian talks about her mother, she shares intimately. When she smiles at me, she lets me know everything's all right. I hope when you see the exhibit, you may come to see caregivers in a different light. You may see yourself in a current situation or a past situation validated. If you may not have had caregiving experience, I hope visiting the exhibit will give you some valuable insights. Thank you.